Hi everybody, I'm Dan Wells. I write horror, fantasy, and science fiction, and I talk about games on the internet. And today we are going back to one of my favorite games, Warhammer Fantasy 4th Edition, to look at the newest installment, or the newest recreation update of the fantastic old campaign, uh, The Enemy Within. This is part three, The Power Behind the Throne. And I have mixed feelings about this one. It's important for you to understand off the bat that this is arguably the most beloved <laughs> uh, section of the Enemy Within campaign. And, and for many good reasons. It is very social, it is very role-play oriented, and it is incredibly variable. I was about to say replayable, and I'm not sure that that's true. Um, I mean, I have played through it more than once, but it's a mystery. Let, let me uh, give you some background on this. Well, let me also say, the reason that I have mixed feelings on this, despite the fact that it is the most beloved one out of the five, is because it is... I, I have some structural issues with it uh, that make it, it... It feels to me like it is not a super cohesive part of the campaign overall. Um, I still absolutely recommend it, which is why I'm doing this video in the first place. I wouldn't be making this otherwise. Um, let's, let's get into a little. So, the power behind the throne takes place in the city of Middenheim, which is far to the north in the Empire, and whereas most of the Empire in the Old World worships the god Sigmar, Middenheim is the power base, the home of the cult of Ulrich, who is a much more wolfy, Nordic, Viking kind of god. Um, and so, what, what's really fascinating about this place, and, and I did the whole video on Middenheim earlier, and I'll link to that later, um, is that this is a city that's on top of a mountain. It's an incredibly large and powerful city that holds a lot of sway in the politics and government and everything of, of uh, the old world at large. And what, you know, the, so, so section two of the Enemy Within campaign is the uh, Death on the Reich, which is probably my favorite one, uh, and many people's favorite. Um, that one is very sandboxy, it's very open, it's very player-oriented in that you can choose whatever you want to do and you zoom around on, you know, a riverboat going up and down, uh, researching things and solving mysteries and fighting bad guys, but also at the same time just kind of running your own riverboat, which is kind of fun. And then that one ends with um, a couple of big clues that say, you've got to go to Middenheim right now. And then this one, you arrive at Middenheim, and almost immediately you are dropped into uh, limbo. <laughs> you, uh, you reach a point very quickly, almost instantly, where you get there to follow up on the clue and realize that it's a dead end. And then you're like, well, we're in Middenheim, what are we supposed to do? And the way the adventure is written, um, I am trying to do this without spoilers. And this is not a spoiler, so I will say it. The, um, there are some severe tax issues and taxing imbalances in the city of Middenheim. Things like people, dwarves and wizards are being taxed at a much higher rate than anybody else. And the adventure relies wholly on the players realizing there is a tax imbalance and deciding to investigate it. And what follows from that is this 
like with Death on the Reich, this incredibly player-driven campaign. And rather than being about uh, going up and down on a river, it is all about getting to know the people. Um, you talk to all the various power brokers and politicians and the movers and the shakers of Middenheim. Uh, you, you know, you get to know them, you help them solve little problems that they have, and in the process you encounter larger problems. And then kind of the final section, so to speak, is this massive festival that comes to town. And so you are still dealing with all the same stuff, talking to people, trying to solve this large political mystery through social interaction, all in the middle of this gargantuan uh, festival. And we'll get into the festival in a bit, and I'll show you some of the stuff, because there's a lot of really neat things that it does. Um, however, eventually, eventually, and this is not, again, not really a spoiler, because the entire campaign is about chaos cults in the old empire. Eventually, you will connect all the dots and realize that this taxing imbalance is actually related to a chaos cultist and what they are trying to do in order to sow discord and bring down the empire. And I'm not going to tell you who that is. I'm not even going to tell you who the suspects are because you need to discover all this for yourself. Um, however, clever players are going to be thinking to themselves the whole time and saying, this is not character knowledge, but player knowledge. Absolutely, this is eventually going to connect back to the Purple Hand cult. Obviously, because that is the villain of this campaign, you wouldn't give us an entire campaign supplement that in no way relates to the actual campaign. And yet, <laughs> despite that, there is the, the hook to get you into this adventure is incredibly weak. Just expecting the players to show up in Middenheim get bored and decide to investigate the taxes locally especially when we just had this awesome riverboat thing going why can't we go back and just get on our riverboat if we have to slog through and slog is an unfair word but if we have to slog through weeks of play and multiple chapters of this book before we eventually get back around to the part that connects to the story we're ostensibly trying to tell why what what hook is going to pull us through that it is it is my opinion and it has always been my opinion that hey the taxes are kind of funky let's stick around let's ignore the purple hand and dig into this tax stuff that's a very weak very weak plot hook for part three of an epic campaign as with Death on the Reich, the speed bump of moving from one book to the next book is significant. And I think it is worse here because it is harder to get around. With Death on the Reich, there's a couple of ways where you can say, hey, you just, you really need to go to this city. And then once you go to that city, then you're fine and everything makes sense and there are meaningful plot hooks to pull you through from one thing to the next. In this case, um, you know, it kind of reminds me of when I was in college and I went to go see uh, Phantom Menace opening night and the credit scrawl for the first three movies, the original trilogy, was all about rebels and exciting stuff and all these amazing, you know, adventure things going on. And then the opening credit scrawl for Phantom Menace was about, you know, the trade union and whatever shenanigans that they were pulling financially and politically. And it just, it's a, it's a speed bump to get over. And trying to convince players, and this has happened both times I've run The Enemy Within, trying to convince them to care about this taxing issue when what they really want to do is follow up on the clue that turned out to just be a jerk around and figuring out what's up with the purple hand cult can be a hard sell. And so what I have often found myself doing is, you know, trying to drop 
early hints in, you know, your arrival at Middenheim that the Purple Hand cult is involved with this. Obviously, they're present, but are they involved with the taxes? Well, clearly, or we wouldn't be asking you to investigate them as part of our Purple Hand campaign. And so, anyway, that's the issue that I have with that. Once you get over that hump, uh, the power behind the throne is very cool, very fun. It can be extremely difficult to run for a GM, uh, but what this fourth edition gives is a lot of play aids that are going to make it a lot easier. And so let's dig into some of those now. Um, so we've got the power behind the throne. So we have, um, you know, there's uh, e so easy to accidentally reveal spoilers as we're clicking through here. Um, so first of all, there's a whole section on how to leave <laughs> your beloved barge from death on the right. And this is, you know, for decades, this has been an issue with the campaign. Everyone loves the river barge. Nobody wants to leave it, which frankly is part of the reason why it is so painful to get to Middenheim and realize that there isn't actually a strong story hook to replace the barge. You just have to kind of make your own way. Um, by the way, clouds, I use natural light for this lighting and clouds are passing by. And so if it's like getting light and dark, that's why. And I apologize. Um, blame nature. Uh, but so there's a lot of like ideas here. Here's some suggestions of how you can encourage them to go to Middenheim how, you know, what you're going to do to uh, get them to leave their boat behind, all these different ways to move on and things like that. And so then once you finally get there, um, well, and then it's got, you know, a lot of ways to travel. How are you going to get to Middenheim? It's very, um, very specific uh, about everything. And it's one of the things I love about Warhammer and about this campaign specifically is... You know, it, it knows everything about the world. It knows how many miles it is for each stop on your journey that you're going to take from Altdorf to Middenheim. And it knows which, you know, where the stops are. And it gives advice on each little leg of the journey. And it gives encounters for you to have that some of them are important, some of them are not. But they make the journey interesting and they uh, are a lot of fun to go through. So then we get to uh, Middenheim itself. And, you know, what do you do when you get there? It is very difficult to run this without the Middenheim book. And the Middenheim book, as I said, is fabulous whether you're running this campaign or not. So I do think that that is a hard recommend that I definitely think everyone should pick up Middenheim if they're going to run Power Behind the Throne. You don't need it. There is enough information in this book. But having the Middenheim book makes it a lot easier. So, you know, there's a lot of things. Uh, this edition has these grognard boxes where you're dealing with people like me who have gone through the game possibly multiple times and they know the secrets. And so it's like, well, how can you change this? How can you mess it around so that you can give players who've done this before something new that they're not expecting? And uh, I really admire the way these grognard boxes are structured so they're not just gotchas like if uh, the bad guy is always one specific person and the uh, players know that it's that person and so they go straight there and they're like hey we know you're the bad guy without having previously collected any evidence uh, it would be very easy in on you know on one hand to say well actually no they're not the bad guy this time ha 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 but the grognard boxes are more interesting than that. And they say, well, if they do immediately go and catch this person, here's some ways that you can still make their lives complicated and hard. Um, here are, you know, backup people. Maybe they're, the cultists have other people hiding in the shadows that they can deal with. So there you go. There's, you know, places to stay, figure out what you're going to, where you're going to live and all these things. And uh, then we get into chapter two, which is kind of a mini version of the Middenheim book. Gives a history of the city, talks about, you know, the various characters that live there. Um, some of this is just a repeat of the Middenheim book, but 
not as much as you would think uh, because it's all structured very specifically around the story that they are trying to tell. Now, um, we, we have the evil plot, and that's chapter 3, where it starts talking about this. And, you know, like I said, it all revolves around taxes, and it really hinges on your players saying, Wait, taxes? Um, let's look into that. Which, in my opinion, doesn't work. Uh, but uh, what I want to show you, because I don't want to show off any of this, I don't want to give away any secrets of the campaign, what I do want to do here is go to the carnival. Because this book does the best job yet of any iteration of this campaign of helping you to run the carnival. And the carnival doesn't really matter to the story, right? Like there's nothing in the plot that requires the carnival to be there. But it makes it a lot more interesting and it's a way of ratcheting up the tension that you have spent all this time just kind of going back and forth to offices or houses or you know secret meetings with various people and you um, you have to talk to them and all of a sudden there's a carnival and that makes some of the people much harder to find it makes some of the people easier to find um, it increases the chances that you will run into the wrong person at the wrong time um, it it really just works really well uh, and I can I, I, I really admire the original writers for putting the carnival in even though it doesn't matter to the story it absolutely matters to the way the story is told and uh, that is just as important so hooray so let me show you what I'm talking about here it has everything. There are, uh, you know, minor encounters you can have, but then uh, the carnival has hourly schedules day by day. Like, there's so many different events going on, and these are all posted publicly. And so, like, here we look at the Festival of Fine Ales, which on this, uh, you know, these three days will happen from noon to 11 p.m. Now, which NPCs are going to be there on Velentag, which one's on Albentag, and which one on Marktag. And then the Horse Fair, which is on Bakertag from 2 to 6 p.m., which NPCs are going to be there. This makes it so nice and wonderful <laughs> to be able to run this, because by the time you get to the carnival, you as the GM and the players will already have a pretty good idea, maybe not of who all the major players are, all the major NPCs, uh, but all the ones that they really need to talk to. And so these names, which right now you can look through this and say, oh, well, Dieter Schmeidehammer from 5 to 6 is going to be at this horse thing. I don't care. Well, by the time you get to the carnival, you will, because you will have dealt with Schmeidehammer, or you will have tried to and not been able to reach him. And this way you can be like, ah, ha, I just saw him at the horse fair. I know... I know what to do now. And then you can sidle up to him at the side and ask if he bet on somebody or whatever, like that. Really, really fabulous stuff. Now, there is a large player aid at the end. Let's look at the... Um, let's look at the table of contents. Um, that. Okay, the table of contents is not going to show me. There's a large player aid at the end that makes this even easier. However, even showing it to you is too big of a spoiler. Um, the, the book itself suggests not even letting players see portions of that player aid because even some of the headings, even just the way in which the information is presented, regardless of the information itself, can be a spoiler. So I'm not going to show it to you Suffice it to say that at the end, there's basically cards for each NPC explaining who they are, why they're important, where they're going to be at every stage of the campaign so that they're easy to find and they're easy to run into. Um, this is arguably the single greatest social sandbox I've ever seen for an RPG uh, because the entire thing just hinges around knowing who to talk to, 
and knowing what to say to them. And so it can be, that's why this is such a popular and beloved campaign supplement, because it is so detailed and it is so rich. That's why it can be so hard to run for a game master, because it is so detailed and it is so rich. These player aids do make that a lot easier. Now, I uh, hesitate to show anything else in here, uh, and so I'm not going to. Um, oh, hey, there's the table of contents that I was looking for here. Appendices, the uh, NPC summary sheets are really valuable. That's kind of what I was talking about. Uh, I don't want to show you anything else there. Um, okay, so one more issue that this campaign can have, and it's interesting to me that in the beginning of this book, when they talked about the new edition, kind of in their introduction, in the foreword that was written, one of the problems that they know from past experience exists in this book is that it can be very difficult for the players to get in and talk to some of the key NPCs simply because the player characters are likely to be too low class, frankly. Uh, if your group consists of a rat catcher and a hedge wizard and a you know, various little things like that, then no, you're not going to be able to talk to the king or the counts or the tax collectors or any of these merchant princes or other politicians. They're not going to want to spend time with you. Now, what's ironic about that is that this edition doesn't really fix that, even though they knew it was an issue. Um, part of the fix for that is built into the fourth edition game system itself. Uh, the way that the player characters have uh, social ratings does help with this because there is like an actual mechanical way for the player characters to improve their social standing over time. Uh, and so that can help to solve that problem. The main issue, in my experience, is that, and I haven't run this fourth edition version yet, and so maybe the problem I foresee is not actually there. Um, but what I suspect is going to happen, based on having run this in other editions, is that the player characters, while they have the opportunity for social advancement, have don't have enough experience yet, they're not high enough level, so to speak, to have made those social advances. Uh, and so unless you actually start with, you know, someone who is a noble or a merchant or something like that in your group, it might be difficult to have the right social clout that you need for this. Uh, you know, the easy fix for that is to just throw in a couple of extra adventures. Finish Death on the Reich, you lose your barge, and then you pick up some of the other supplements. You go to Uber's Reich for a while, and you, and you level up. You uh, get the uh, Rough Days and Hard Nights, or Rough Nights and Hard Days, whatever it's called, supplement that I reviewed before, which I love and adore, and let people run through maybe one or two of those adventures. Give them a chance to bulk up their experience and their social standing before they get to Middenheim. Because not only will that give them a more feasible opportunity to talk to these very powerful people in Middenheim, it also, frankly, might make them a lot more invested in the taxing issue. Um, and they, you know, if they are the kinds of people who regularly deal with important financial or political issues, then sure, they're going to be like, whoa, this is interesting. Let's uh, delve deeper into this problem. So anyway, overall, I do recommend this. I recommend it very strongly. Uh, Power Behind the Throne is beloved for a reason, and it can provide a kind of social role-playing sandbox scenario that is exceptionally rare in the industry and has never, in my opinion, been done as well as it is done here. Uh, the chance to you know, go back and forth and talk to people and really build a social network 
around the PCs and in the city and get them to really know all of the people and who they are. It's really phenomenal. And the story that it tells is excellent. There are those two speed bumps getting into it, though. And while they are not impossible to overcome, they are going to take some work on the part of the PCs, or on the part of the GM, really. Now, the next one, uh, the next section, this is section three of the Enemy Within campaign. Section four, historically, has been uh, something rotten in Kislev, which is, if you think this one is unrelated, <laughs> that one is incredibly unrelated. Uh, Power Behind the Throne starts off with a dead end that gets you into a different story that eventually circles back irrevocably to the main storyline. Something Rotten in Kislev never connects back to the main storyline at all and uh, has always been considered the weakest part of the campaign. What uh, Cubicle 7 is doing right now with this campaign is they're changing that. And Section 4 is a brand new section of the campaign, newly written by a lot of the original writers, called The Horned Rat. Uh, I am very interested to see, because it is brand new, if it is going to have these same speed bumps that the other books always have. Moving from, you know, Shadows Over Bogenhofen into Death on the Reich is tricky. The motivations aren't always there. Moving from Death on the Reich into Power Behind the Throne, motivations aren't there. Is there going to be a smoother transition from 3 into the brand new 4? I don't know. We'll see. I'm excited to find out. Uh, anyway, upcoming review, long before we get to uh, the Horned Rat, or Shadow of the Horned Rat, or whatever it's called, is going to be the Power Behind the Throne Companion. And frankly, that might solve any or all of the issues that I have with this. I just got it today. I haven't had a chance to read through it yet. Um, but what they've been doing with these 4th edition books is uh, each campaign book comes with a companion book that makes it easier to run. It fleshes out some of the characters, provides a bunch of extra options, gives a bunch of extra information on how different things work. Uh, so I, I have high hopes that that companion book is going to help smooth out these transitions from... Uh, Death on the Reich into Power Behind the Throne. Give some good social standing to the characters. Give them a solid reason to investigate the taxes of a city they've never been to. Um, so, we'll see. And I hope to get that review out very soon. In the meantime, I would love to hear from you what you are interested in hearing about. Is there a role-playing supplement or a brand new role-playing game that you would love to get my opinion on, I probably have it in my library and I am just churning through them very slowly, but uh, I, I would be happy to put your particular interests on the top of the pile if you have them. So let me know and uh, we'll dig into that. Let me also say as just a final plug for myself at the end, uh, just because I love eating and paying my mortgage, I write books. I've got 18 books in print. Uh, it actually might be 19 now, because one just came out last week called Stargazer. It is an Audible original, brand new, hard science fiction, middle grade novel about uh, a couple of kids who are in a colony on another planet. Full cast audio, music and sound effects, really cool stuff. First book in that series is called Zero G. Second one is called Dragon Planet. The third one is Stargazer. So go look those up. Uh, in fact, if you are an Audible member, you can listen to Stargazer completely for free. And I think that might also be true of uh, the first two books. Um, so, hooray. It's kind of the Netflix model. You don't have to buy it. You just have to have the paid membership, and then you can listen to a bunch of their books completely free. And Stargazer is one of those books. So go check that out. Also, as always... I am a professional game master. I can run a campaign or a one-shot for you, including, if you're interested, the Power in the Throne, uh, Power Behind the Throne, and the Enemy Within campaign. So, uh, check out all the links below. Drop me a comment, subscribe, leave me an email, and uh, I will talk to you later. Anyway, my name is Dan Wells, and you are awesome.